thank the gods you are here, fellow humans. I wouldn't want to be without you for episode 4 of ASM Murder, the show that unpacks some of the most gruesome crimes committed on American soil and beyond. Each episode I cover a chilling murder case sifting through all the facts and speculations. This week we are going full on sorted with the Wonderland Murders. As a human child, I knew the name John Holmes well before I knew why he was famous. His name was whispered here and there with side glances at nearby people to make sure that no one was heard uttering the name John Holmes. Little did I know at the time that to know the name John Holmes meant you were involved in one of two things, drugs or porn, maybe even both at the same time. Either way, it was my familiarity and my unfamiliarity at the same time that tinged my view of this case when I first heard about it. I never knew until I got older what happened to old John Holmes. His was, at least to me, one of those famous people stories who faded into obscurity. Then I found out he, spoiler alert, died. But I just assumed that that was from AIDS. It was the 80s after all. His business naturally exposed him to it, and the AIDS scare was all anyone was talking about at the time. From school assemblies surrounding it to after-school specials focusing on it, it was a scary time when a mix of truth and falsehood showed a broken face to the public. And this was the impression that I had of John Holmes. And this is where we join him with the Wonderland murder case. Welcome to ASM Murder the true crime podcast with an ASMR twist. I am your host, The Gru, and I am a star, I'm a star, I'm a star, I'm a star, I'm a big, bright, shining star. In the summer of 1981, the notorious drug group known as the Wonderland Gang were brutally attacked in their home. They were bludgeoned to death in the middle of the night and left for dead. The Los Angeles-based drug gang made a habit of disguising themselves as cops and making fraudulent busts on drug dealers around the city. One robbery, however, would be their last, as the victim retaliated with cold-blooded murder. The Wonderland murder case, in typical L.A. fashion, has more than just drugs. Amongst the Hollywood backdrop, the murder case involves cocaine, millions of dollars, and a porn star. It is also partly inspired one of the most iconic movies of the 1990s, the Paul Thomas Anderson classic, Boogie Nights. This is the Wonderland murder case. Content warning. This episode contains graphic content not suitable for some audiences with mention and or descriptions of crime scenes, graphic violence, drug use, and sex. Listener discretion is therefore advised. Los Angeles in the 1970s and early 80s. It was a wild time in Hollywood. While crime dramas excelled at this time in the film industry, other genres were emerging and gaining popularity. One branch of the industry existed in the underbelly of Tinseltown. Filled with sex and bad plots, the porn industry became a booming sector of Hollywood. One of the breakout stars of the growing porn industry of the late 1970s and early 80s was a young Midwesterner named John Holmes. He was born August 8, 1944 in Ohio. His mother left his father and took he and his brothers to a struggling neighborhood in Columbus. He left his family in Ohio at 15 and joined the army. He served in Germany for three years before being discharged. He moved to California and married a nurse named Sharon Gigny. Throughout his life, John was known for being a liar, constantly lying about his childhood and his origin story in interviews and on sets. He became one of the most famous porn stars of all time and starred in close to 600 adult films over his career. But with great success also comes temptation. Holmes enjoyed his life of fame but felt he needed more to fulfill his lifestyle. Although he started his career drug-free, he quickly turned to substances. His addiction took over his life. He began doing drugs on set, leading to tension with cast members and poor on-screen performances. The film industry is notorious for its tumultuous relationship with drugs and alcohol. 
The two have almost become intrinsically linked, so it's no surprise that drugs play such a vital and devastating role in one of its biggest stars, at least in the porno film industry. Porn films broke more into the mainstream with the popularity of movies like Deep Throat 1972, Behind the Green Door 1972, and The Devil and Miss Jones 1973. Porn was not illegal to consume, but it was illegal to make. So audiences could flock to the movie theater and watch these films, but the crew that made them needed to do so with great discretion. If they were caught filming porn movies, they would get arrested. Holmes avoided arrest throughout his career mainly by being an informant for the Los Angeles Police Department. His addiction to both cocaine and freebasing eventually took over his life. His career and his marriage started to crumble. Desperate for more drugs and greater connections, Holmes made friends with powerful people in both industries, including Eddie Nash. Nash owned several nightclubs in L.A., but his real business was behind closed doors. He was one of the biggest narcotics dealers and organized crime members in town. He and Holmes became friends as Holmes became a regular house guest at Nash's mansion. Serving as a 24-7 drug den, Nash's mansion was a revolving door of customers. Holmes, in particular, made himself feel at home and became a regular freebaser with Nash. As Holmes became more trapped in his life of drugs, he found himself surrounded by dangerous groups and people. One such group was the notorious Wonderland Gang. The toxic mixture of drugs, sex, fame, and money changed the lives of Holmes, Nash, the Wonderland Gang, and the friends, colleagues, and loved ones that surrounded them. The fun and recklessness of the Hollywood drug scene would turn fatal and serve as a backdrop to one of the most gruesome crime scenes in Los Angeles history. 8763 Wonderland Avenue in Laurel Canyon. This was the address of the notorious drug gang known as the Wonderland Gang. Their place of residence and business would become more well known for its blood splatter than its drug use. The house was a typical house in Laurel Canyon. It stood three stories, including a garage, on the first floor. It was a white rectangle that blended into the street and surrounding neighborhood. Like any other house in the street, had two balconies and a concrete staircase leading to the front door. On the outside, it was a quaint and unsuspecting home, but on the inside, deals and drugs ran rampant. On the night of July 1st, 1981, four members were brutally murdered in the house. One member barely survived as she was left for dead. The first murder happened in the living room. The victim was found on the floor by the sofa. The second victim was killed in one of the bedrooms. They were lying in bed and sustained massive head wounds. In the third level bedroom, two more victims died. One was on the bed. The other died slouched on the floor. When the police walked through the house studying the scene, the place had been completely ransacked. One of the bodies on the bed was even covered with random items from the room in the wake of the ransacking. Police believe that people walked through the house looking for drugs and money, stepping over the dead bodies and failing to notify the authorities about the murders. Blood was everywhere in the house, on the walls, the carpet, and the furniture. All of the victims were brutally beaten to death with a combination of weapons such as hammers and metal pipes. Who were the members of the Wonderland Gang? Ron Lanius, William DeVerrill, David Lind, Tracy McCourt, and Joy Miller were the members of the gang. Their associates and housemates were Suvin Murphy Lanius and Barbara Richardson. Ron, William, Joy, and Barbara were all killed during the massacre. Susan was left for dead in the house but barely survived the attack. David Lind was not at the house at the time of the murder and, luckily for him, was held up at a hotel room on a bender. The Wonderland Gang was a group of drug dealers heavily involved in the cocaine trades in the late 70s and early 80s. The group primarily focused on trafficking cocaine and was considered one of the most influential and feared cocaine distributors in all of Los Angeles. They dealt cocaine and heroin directly out of their home. Lanius was a person of interest in over 10 homicide cases. He had built a reputation after time spent in Vietnam after he was dishonorably discharged for smuggling drugs back home in the dead bodies of U.S. servicemen. They also participated in burglaries and robberies around the city. They would frequently disguise themselves as cops and perform fake drug busts on unsuspecting addicts and dealers. 
Their very last robbery was committed two days prior to their fatal demise. One of their recurring clients was porn star John Holmes. He frequented Wonderland Avenue to support his drug habit and quickly became somewhat friends with the group. The gang, however, viewed him more as a freak show than a true friend. By the time Holmes started spending time with the Wonderland gang, his career had hit a standstill due to his addiction issues. He was a porn star has-been and almost seen as a laughingstock around Los Angeles. One of the things that made Holmes such a sensation in the porn industry was the size of his penis. He had the largest penis in the business, which made him incredibly popular. The Wonderland gang reportedly constantly asked him to pull his pants down and show off his package, as if he were a variety act or a freak show. Holmes was desperate for drugs and belongings, so he endured the teasing. He himself was known for stealing from friends and strangers in order to get money for drugs. He stole luggage from airports, took items from his wife's drawers, and took advantage of his friends and colleagues. This made him fit in well with the gang and their criminal tactics. One day, Holmes suggested a potential robbery victim for the gang, his friend Eddie Nash. Worth about $30 million, Eddie Nash seemed like the perfect robbery victim. Everyone in town knew that Nash was a drug dealer, and even law enforcement knew. He was regularly raided, but it never stopped him from continuing. He kept a ton of his money and drugs in his house and constantly held house parties where people would come and do drugs with him. It was a continual cycle of drug addicts. Holmes felt this was the perfect avenue to get inside his mansion and rob him. So, John Holmes helped the Wonderland gang hatch a scheme. On June 29th, John Holmes went to Eddie Nash's house to freebase with him. It was a regular practice for the pair, so nothing was suspicious at all. After a few hours of getting high, Holmes leaves the house. But he leaves the back sliding door open so that the Wonderland gang can sneak inside. A few hours later, they enter the house disguised as police officers, but are almost immediately confronted by Eddie's bodyguard, Greg Diles. After a small scuffle, Greg is grazed with a bullet and down for the count. The commotion wakes up Nash, who pleads with them on his hands and knees to spare his life. He then leads them to his safe, where they take $1.2 million worth of illegal drugs, cash, jewelry, and weapons from him. As they leave, they make another crucial decision. They decide to leave Eddie Nash and his bodyguard alive. Immediately following the humiliation of being robbed, Nash sent out his henchmen to find out who robbed him. Back at Wonderland Avenue, the crew had divided up the riches gathered from the robbery that night, but Holmes was unhappy with his share. Greg Dial supposedly ran into John Holmes in Hollywood, who was stupidly wearing one of Nash's rings that had just been stolen. One witness, Scott Thorson, claimed to have seen John Holmes tied to a chair, beaten, and threatened, forcing him to reveal the identities of the robbers. And, around 3 a.m. on July 1st, an unknown number of people entered the Wonderland Avenue house and murdered four people. It is believed that John Holmes led the group to the house and let them in the front door. It wasn't until 4 p.m. on July 1st that authorities were notified. Police received a panic phone call from a mover next door. The man heard a desperate pain bone coming from next door. Susan Lanius, the only victim to survive the attack, had been on the floor for nearly 12 hours, her skull broken. Despite claiming to have no part in the murders, John Holmes' fingerprints were found on a bedpost inches from one of the dead bodies. Holmes was arrested and charged with four counts of murder. Police interviewed neighbors who admitted that many had heard yells and screams but chalked it up to the typical rough parties that the house had on a regular basis. The police found Wonderland gang member David Lind completely distraught at the scene of the crime a few days later. They took him to the station where he told them that he knew who killed them. They decided to work with him and built his trust, so they let him go for the crimes he implicated himself for, including the robbery of Eddie Nash. The prosecution for the trial argued that Holmes had retaliated against the Wonderland gang because he was unhappy with the division of drugs and cash after the robbery. Nash was questioned, arrested, and charged with planning the murders, but was saved by a, forgive the pun, hung jury. Nash's bodyguard, Gregory Diles, was also released from police custody and acquitted of any murder charges. Later, Nash would admit to bribing the single dissenting jury on the original trial. 
It wasn't until 2000 that Eddie Nash was arrested and charged with drug trafficking and money laundering. He was never convicted of the murder. Police could never gather enough concrete evidence to convict any one of the murders. Holmes made a deal with the police, promising to give them information about the events that transpired on that night. But he never followed through. With not enough evidence to support a full charge and conviction, Holmes was let go. Despite police surveillance, Holmes managed to skip town with his girlfriend and drive across the country under a fake name. He was eventually discovered in Florida when his girlfriend, who had been disgustingly abused and trafficked by Holmes, told her brother where they were. Police showed up and took Holmes back into custody, but the lack of secure evidence implicating Holmes for the actual murders allowed him to be let go again. Holmes tried to revive his porn star career, but was not very successful. In 1986, Holmes was diagnosed as HIV positive. He still, however, continued to have sex on screen in films and kept his diagnosis a secret from his co-stars. John Holmes died of medical complications due to AIDS on March 13, 1988. He was 43 years old. Gregory Diles died from liver failure on January 16, 1997 at age 48. Eddie Nash died of unspecified causes on August 9, 2014, at the age of 85. The Wonderland gang member David Lynn died from a heroin overdose in 1995. The story of the murders of these groups of people inspired Hollywood. Boogie Nights, starring Mark Wahlberg, Burt Reynolds, Julianne Moore, and directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, was loosely based on John Holmes and the Wonderland gang. The 1990s classic, however, did not take it so far as to incorporate the murders into the plot and instead opted to make the film more lighthearted. The story came from the mockumentary The Dirk Diggler Story, based on the 1991 documentary Exhausted John C. Holmes' The Real Story. Dirk Diggler was an iconic character played by John Holmes in the height of his career. In 2003, Lionsgate made Wonderland, a film based on John Holmes and the Wonderland murders. The movie starred Val Kilmer as John Holmes, Kate Bosworth as his girlfriend Dawn, Dylan McDermott as David Lind, Carrie Fisher as Sally Hansen, Christina Applegate as Susan Lanius, Josh Lucas as Ron Lanius, Faison Love as Greg Diles, Janine Garofalo as Joy Miller, Tim Blake Nelson as Billy Deverell, Natasha Gregson Wagner as Barbara Richardson, Lisa Kudrow as Sharon Holmes, and Eric Bogosian as Eddie Nash. The movie follows the events after the murder as John Holmes and his girlfriend Dawn are on the run while police try to piece together the events of that fatal night. It makes sense that a story so intertwined with the film industry would inspire Hollywood to make movies about it. Despite how plausible it sounds that the murder was retaliation by Nash, Diles, and Holmes, the murder case is still technically unsolved to this day. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for this, the fourth episode of ASM Murder. It is always a pleasure and an honor to have you along with me on this journey. You can catch me here every Monday when I drop new episodes, more or less regularly. You can catch my episodes on Spotify, Stitcher, iTunes, and Google Podcast. You can also find all of my episodes on my website at murderpod.net. That's M-U-R-D-E-R-P-O-D dot net. Also, if you dig what I do and you want to help me keep the lights on in the joint, you can go to my website and maybe throw a couple bucks at me. If you can't, that's okay too. I'm just happy to be able to share the time with you. Until next time, be kind to yourselves, be good to each other.